Hi, it's Dwyer. It's Friday, July the 9th, 2021. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. BettingEggle.us, a free site. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, in my favorites folder right now, you have one of the better boxing interviews I've come across, right? To the younger generation, let me just say, these two men, Mike Tyson interviewing Oscar De La Hoya, were two of the biggest box office draws during their eras. Right? Mike Tyson in the 1980s was huge. Hell, Mike Tyson in the 90s was huge. But in the 80s, we thought he was a paradigm shift. Now, I'm not here to say that there weren't other fighters in the 80s with huge profiles. Right? Larry Holmes, Ray Leonard, Hitman, Duran, Marvin Hagler. Right? Don't get me wrong. The 80s had some guys. But in 1988, you understood that the top of the mountain was Mike Tyson, right? Tyson really brought an energy to the heavyweight division that hadn't existed for quite some time, right? Singular figure, very important in boxing. His boxing show right now has a dynamic most don't have. Understand, you have great fighters, Oscar De La Hoya, really one of the box office kings of the 1990s, right? Guys like Oscar show up and they talk to Mike and it's great fighter talking to great fighter. Tyson can ask some questions that outsiders can't ask, right? He can laugh with his guests about the ecosystem of boxing, dealing with managers, dealing with promoters, right? Tyson had run-ins with people like Don King. Well, let me just say, here he has Oscar, and let's be clear here. Understand how big Oscar was. Everyone knew, every promoter knew that Cinco de Mayo in Las Vegas belonged to Oscar De La Hoya, Right? In the 90s, obviously, you had Lennox Lewis, Roy Jones, right, Evander Holyfield. There were some other guys who distinguished themselves in the 90s, right? Okay, fair enough. But Oscar was huge. So, of course, Tyson and Oscar start talking. Both of them have had their problems, right? You might recall Mike Tyson was uptown in a back alley and he had a run-in with Mitch Green outside of the ring, away from official scores. You might recall Oscar was involved with some self-employed models, right? Um, had some issues. Well, let me just say, this interview is so deep that Oscar talks about using mushrooms, Oscar opens up about the problems in his life and how he used boxing to release that anger, right? Mike Tyson at one point, and Tyson's an excellent interviewer, very empathetic. Mike Tyson at one point says to Oscar, hey, look, you know, you know you're special, don't you? You know, Tyson felt a need to almost be a big brother to Oscar, and to remind Oscar, hey, look, you know, great fighter to great fighter, as we talk about the feeling of survivor's guilt that we have, right? And Tyson openly is talking about people he grew up with who he thought were better than him and how he surpassed them and how they then resented him, right? I'm just telling you, he and Oscar then start agreeing on stuff that you're not going to find in a typical boxing interview. You're not going to find in one of these, you know, legacy media outlets. The Oscar De La Hoya interview done by Mike Tyson is in my favorites folder right now. If you're a fan of boxing, 
It's a must watch, right? It's a must watch. Tyson's the kind of guy who liked Charles Barkley for basketball. Other stars feel a need to be honest with. So when Tyson says, hey, man, how's your retirement going? Oscar De La Hoya, Oscar says, terribly. Right, Oscar, <laughs> you know, Tyson's the person he could talk to. Definitely worth your time. Now let's talk about what's going on in the UK for a moment. You know, boxing's a weird sport where for some odd reason, certain parts of the globe, have fighters who seem to have a certain trait, right? Philadelphia in the United States. You know, we'll call it the ghost of Joe Fraser. There's something going on with Philly where every fighter out of Philly seems to have a left hook, right? I don't know what it is. You hear the guys from Philly, you don't need to know anything else. You know the guy has a good left hook. This is even before you look at his record. Right? They say Philly, you say, okay, this, this guy has a great left hook. Well, right now in the UK, something's going on here. Because you have some of the best jabs in boxing. Right? These are the kind of jabs where the guy doesn't have to do anything else. Right? He's hitting you with the jab. It's roughing you up. It's bludgeoning you. And the guy, of course... It's keeping you on the outside. You can't even get inside. I'm going to name three guys. They're all from the UK. They're in different weight classes. An argument can be made that they have the best jabs in their weight classes. And they're all from the UK. Right? Light heavyweight. King Arthur. Lyndon Arthur. He has a fight coming up. If you're a jab enthusiast, it's a must watch. At Cruiserweight, Lawrence Okole. Right? Let's just say his jab is so good that he beat a fighter in his last fight who I didn't think he'd be able to beat. And he controlled the guy, dominated the guy behind the jab. And understand, the guy had fought other elite fighters. I hadn't seen him this controlled by a jab before. The Okoli fight. And of course, at heavyweight, you know who I think is the best. This guy actually has a mobile jab, right? If there's a fault on King Arthur and on Okoli, it's that they don't get up on the balls of their feet and move around while bludgeoning you with the jab. At heavyweight, you have a guy who does, Tyson Fury, right? Understand, Tyson Fury, if he decides to be on his front foot, and I say that because the guy has an extensive back foot game, if he decides to be on his front foot after he recovers from COVID and fights Deontay Wilder, right? By the way, this is Wilder's best chance to beat Tyson Fury, right? Fury on COVID, right? Fury might need an IV entering the ring. If you can't beat the guy when he's healthy, hell, why not take his title when the guy's on COVID? But the authorities won't allow that fight to go forward if there's a health risk. But understand, if Tyson Fury wanted, this is the level of talent I think the guy has. On his front foot, he could bludgeon. With, with a jab, he could bludgeon Deontay Wilder. And if he hangs around for four or five rounds, winning the rounds, and Wilder starts to get desperate, then he could finish Wilder. Then he could decide, okay, let me throw some straight right hands. I believe Fury's jab is that good. So to the rest of the world, what the hell is going on? How did one country come up with the best jab in three different weight classes. It's outrageous. Let me shift gears here a little bit and talk about a guy. Now, at light heavyweight, I mentioned Lyndon Arthur, right? He's not the world champion, but he's something like the 
intercontinental European champion or something like that. I want to be clear here on who I think is the best at light heavyweight. Right? I know Canelo beat Kovalev. I understand uh, Arthur Baturbiev is still out there, still unbeaten. Right? Gilberto Ramirez fights this weekend. He's someone to look at, 41 and 0. But I believe the best at 175 pounds is Dimitri Bivol or Bivol, right? I'll call him Bivol. You know, I think he's so good that people are afraid to fight him. Understand, he has an open offer to drop down to 168 pounds to fight people like Canelo. No one takes him up on it. If anyone visits the light heavyweight division, right, they never call this guy out. They're fighting people like Kovalev, not Bivol. Now, I believe Bivol is the best at 175. But if there's a guy out there who would give him a tough fight, I don't believe it's Baturbiev, right? I take Bivol over Baturbiev. Right? Let's let's just randomly call an unbeaten uh, matchup here. Right? Two unbeaten fighters, both with belts. I would take Bivol over Baturbiev. But the fighter who intrigues me is Gilberto Ramirez. Right? He's a southpaw. He's been a champion at 168 pounds. He fights Sullivan Barrera this weekend. Now, let me just say, you know, I'm a child of the 70s. I'm accustomed to guys who could move, throw the jab, and use length. In other words, an Ali or a Larry Holmes bent their upper bodies backwards. You had to get by the jab then. You had to get by the lean. Now, I understand there aren't a lot of leaners in the sport today. Okay, fair enough, right? There will be over time. But right now, even big men like Gilberto Ramirez, six two and a half, right? He's fighting at 175. He walks around a lot heavier. Even big men like him lean forward. Right? With Ramirez, it's a tragedy because I've seen Ramirez's jab. And it's a great jab. This guy could be a great jabber. But he has too much Josh Taylor in him. Right? This is the guy who has skills who wants to fight you. Right? He doesn't want to outbox you. This isn't Ali beating Liston, and then in the post-fight interview saying, look at me, I'm as pretty as a girl. Right? This isn't the kind of guy who wants to say, hey, look, the goal in boxing is to not get hit, which is what Floyd Mayweather used to say. Right? Ramirez is that fighter guy who wants to throw combinations of power punches who wants to collapse the pocket on you, who's fighting Arthur Abraham and wants to trade with him, right? This isn't the guy who's moving around his ring. This isn't Hector Camacho from back in the day who is moving around the ring and is showboating to the crowd while he takes you apart. Now, this is a different personality type. I like Ramirez over Sullivan Barrera. Barrera's older. Ramirez, when he wants, can be high volume. Ramirez is that rare fighter who has more than he shows you. Right? Again, he has a great jab. He doesn't use it. He has height. He gives it away, leaning forward. He has power, but what's interesting is he doesn't load up on every shot, right? 
what this guy has is a reserve. He's talking out the side of his neck when he says, hey, I want to fight Canelo. Right? Not enough people know who he is. And he's 41 and oh, Understand, between him and Canelo, only he's unbeaten. Right? Gilberto Ramirez has a hard time getting fights against elite light heavyweights, his current division. Well, on the one hand, he's talking about wanting to fight Canelo. As if Canelo's dance card isn't filled already. Right? Canelo's like Manny Pacquiao. Everyone in the area code wants to fight him. Right? Caleb Plant wants to fight him. Jamal Charlo wants to fight him. Golovkin wants to fight him. Right? Canelo, quite frankly, if he decides to give up titles, could deliver a bunch of marquee fights to the public, irrespective of titles, for the next 18 to 24 months without any of us claiming that he's not fighting high-caliber opponents. Well, understand, Gilberto Ramirez, there's no outcry for him, even though he's 41 and oh. This guy reminds me of Bernard Hopkins. If you recall Hopkins at middleweight, there were several years there where Hopkins was dominant in the ring. And no one cared. People barely knew he existed. It wasn't until the Felix Trinidad fight later in his career that people started watching. Well, Gabito Ramirez, folks, might be having a Hall of Fame career. I agree. He has to fight some big names at 175. He's talking, by the way, not just of fighting Canelo, but of moving the heavyweight, right? I haven't come across too many fighters other than Oscar Chavez, who takes this new bridger weight category seriously, right? Keep in mind, Ramirez isn't even a cruiserweight. He wants to go to heavyweight. Well, I believe the guy has the punch, the guy has the volume. What bothers me with him is he doesn't have the center of gravity, right? I don't think it's gonna matter against the Sullivan Barrera who doesn't hit hard enough to materially change the fight on one shot. Don't get me wrong, I like Barrera, but he's older. And if you're gonna stop a 30-year-old Gilberto Ramirez, Right, a hard-hitting southpaw who wants to fight you, not box you. I believe you need more artillery than Sullivan Barrera has. I expect Gilberto Ramirez to beat Sullivan Barrera. More importantly, I want people to assess Gilberto Ramirez's chances at light heavy, Right? Think about him against someone like Lyndon Arthur. Arthur Baturbiev, who would certainly try to walk through him. That would be a superstar fight. And against Bivol, the man I consider the best at 175. What I want you to also do, given that Ramirez is secretly a lot heavier than 175, and let me just point out, too, that's another cause for concern. Because when you're younger, when you're 21, you can yo-yo your weight a little bit. Your body will forgive you. Not so much when you're 30. Right? There might be a fight. Hasn't happened yet, but there might be a fight. Where Ramirez misses weight by two or more pounds. Right? Let me just say, the yo-yoing in weight at 30, a little bit of a red flag for me. The fact that he gives away his height, you know what? That works when you're 6'2 and a half at 168. 
that might work if you're six two and a half at one seventy five. Folks, you get up at cruiser. You get up at heavyweight. You start dealing with punchers, guys who are going to feel grateful that you're ridiculous enough to be leaning over the pocket, right? It's too late, in my opinion, to change Gilberto Ramirez's center of gravity. So let's enjoy the show while it lasts. Right? I think a Ramirez Lawrence Ocole fight would be tremendous. Right? Tremendous. That would be for the title at Cruiser. I think Ramirez against any of the champs at 175, that would be tremendous. We celebrate Floyd Mayweather for having a record of 50 and 0. This guy's at 41 and 0. Has anyone figured out that if this guy continues his winning streak and beats a few more fighters, sooner or later someone is going to look at his resume and they're going to see the excellent career that he's had. I expect Ramirez, because he can't help himself, he's a fighter, not a boxer, I expect Ramirez to come forward, to lean over the pocket, to throw combinations, of hooks and uppercuts, right? I'm just telling you, he's smooth. So he doesn't look like he's exerting himself. But his punches have pop. Let me also say, too, there's another dynamic. You know, he doesn't look like he has blinding hand speed. This isn't Ray Leonard. But somehow... The guys he's fighting are always unprepared for his punch combinations. This is a guy who's sequential, like Chris Eubank today. Right? By the way, people with belts need to give Eubank a shot at the title. I'm getting tired at 160 of hearing everyone talk about, and 168, hearing everyone talk about the fights they want to have, right, without actually hopping in the ring with Eubank or Demetrius Andre, right? Don't tell us you can beat the guy. Show us. I believe Zerdo, Gilberto Ramirez, the southpaw, is going to beat Sullivan Barrera in his next fight. Let's start considering him as a threat to the throne at light heavy, and cruiser, maybe even bridger weight, if that weight class develops. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.